Hey everyone, this video will be a bit different than my normal ones, but I was thrilled to share a special moment with you guys. Uh, recently, I had the incredible honor of speaking to a group of high school students at Owatonna High School here in Southern Minnesota. And in my speech, I talked about one of the most important factors that I believe contributed to my success from my days as a high school athlete to running track at Duke University, getting into Mayo for medical school and ultimately excelling enough in medical school to now be an orthopedic surgery resident at the Mayo Clinic. And uh, throughout this journey, there has just been, I think one consistent element that I credit for my achievements. Um, and it's just, it's just a mindset that I was able to develop. That's really just been the key kind of secret weapon to my success. So um, I hope that my story inspires you to embrace this mindset and pursue your own dreams with a sense of unwavering determination. And I hope that you enjoy this speech. Today, I just wanted to talk a little bit about my personal story, basically how I got here presenting in front of you all and reflecting on my story, I unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, found that the success that I experienced is really nothing based on anything particularly special about me. It's really just based on two things. One, God, of course, but two, in the topic of this presentation, a love that I found for the hard things. I wasn't always this way, finding like enjoyment for difficult, challenging things. I much rather, as you can see, enjoy just time on the couch. Um, the last thing that I would want to do is come home in the afternoon and study anything, which I'm sure that some of you guys can resonate with. Um, and, you know, binge watching, particularly in my case, some anime, falling asleep on the couch was kind of a perfect uh, afternoon routine for me. But when I was in high school, I resonated with someone who I'm sure many of you will ultimately recognize. And um, this person actually really reframed the way that I thought. And here are a few quotes from this person. A lot of people say they want to be great, but they're not willing to make the sacrifices necessary to achieve greatness. The will to win is important, but the will to prepare is what really matters. Gotta love this one. You just have to outwork everyone. And I can't relate to lazy people. We don't speak the same language. And this was harsh. <laughs> but do you, any of you guys know it, who, who may have said some of these things? So, yep, <laughs> Mr. Coleman knew in the back. So this is, uh, these are quotes from the late great Kobe Bryant. This is someone not only for not only known for being a good basketball player, but someone who just had this way of thinking. It was often termed this Mamba mentality, but it really was just his genuine love for hard things. In these quotes, he's celebrating sacrifice, pride preparation, outworking people. None of these things are easy or enjoyable. And then he goes on to attack laziness, which felt personal given my clear love for the couch, as you saw. But I wanted to develop the same love for hard things. And I thought no better place to start than sports. And even though I couldn't have been the basketball player Kobe was, even though I definitely tried, I did find success in track. This doesn't mean that success came easy. I remember consistently looking around at my peers who were oftentimes bigger and stronger than I was. And uh, as you can see here, I oftentimes wore hoodies despite it being like 80 degrees outside so that my biceps wouldn't be compared to my competitors. I was just always kind of the, the, the scrawny guy. Um, but in track, I was able to not only exercise my body, but also my mind and grow this desire to eventually fall in love with doing hard things. I mean, for most sports, you run mostly just because you're in trouble, but in track, you run just to run, and I am not the kind of run for fun kind of guy. But because it was hard every day, I practiced leaning into it. The resistance I felt to finish strong during our sprint training or take those last few jumps at the end of practice at 100% was a sign to me that that was exactly what I was supposed to do. And the more I did it during practice, the more opportunities I realized I had outside of practice. So those Saturday mornings when there was nothing going on, I turned away from the easier things that I wanted to do and turned towards the harder things of getting some extra strength and conditioning work in. Here you can see me and a few friends that I convinced to join me for some additional strength and conditioning work. It was the last thing that I wanted to do, but again, at this point, I recognized that just meant it was the first thing I probably should do. And the funny thing about approaching life like this is you'll start to experience rewards of moving against the grain. In reality, it's probably the rewards that we really fall in love with, but the key is having the brain make the connection between chasing a hard thing and getting rewarded. In my case, I started to excel more in track than I ever thought I could. I was able to directly watch my performance improve the more I trained and the harder I trained. My sprint times were lowering and my long jump marks were getting further and further. This created a feedback loop where my improvement got me excited and motivated to improve more, which told me that I had to keep chasing the hard thing, which allowed me to improve and become excited and motivated again. This ultimately allowed me to record the furthest long jump mark in the state of Colorado my senior year, 
receive medals in the long jump, triple jump, high jump, and on our four by one team at state, and ultimately have the opportunity to continue my career at Duke University. But at this point, I had truly recognized the power of moving against the grain and pursuing the hard thing. And this built such a confidence in myself that my plan was to continue chasing hard more than anyone I knew with an ultimate goal of going to the Olympics. Everything was going great. I feel like whenever you see that, it's usually like a dun 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 kind of moment. Then just in the second track meet of my freshman year, I suffered a devastating knee injury while long jumping. And this was more than just the kind of ACL kind of thing. I tore every ligament, including my ACL, that was holding the lower part of my leg to the upper part. And don't worry, I wanted to include the video of the injury. Uh, my wife would not let me do that. I think that's probably wise. <laughs> but I, I, after this injury, I had to be taken out of this track meet in an ambulance. And when I got to the hospital, the doctors were so worried about how traumatic the injury was that they called my parents who were on the other side of the country and said there was a chance that I would lose my leg. The fear that they had was that I had vascular damage and wouldn't be able to get blood flow to the lower part of my leg. But thankfully I did walk in here on both of my own two feet. And although surgery went better than I could have ever hoped, I was still devastated about losing my Olympic dream. I ultimately had knee reconstructive surgery, which would have me in physical pain and on, and on crushes for nearly half of the year. I was told that I would never walk normally, let alone ever compete again, just a few months into arriving on campus. And I was on the other side of the country, far from my family. But because of my previous experiences, particularly in high school, where I thought I was just training my body, I had inherently also been training my mind. So thinking about these challenges actually gave me a sense of motivation. The easy thing would have been accepting that my career had ended before it even started and moved back to Colorado with my parents. But I was going to see just how far I could go if I kept chasing the hard thing. So I worked with a physical therapist, oftentimes twice a day, including weekends, and was lucky enough to have an initial nerve injury heal that allowed me to slowly progress in my walking. That video on the left there is actually the first time that I walked without crutches, um, which is probably four to five months after I had uh, surgery. And you can see how excited I was, but after I showed this to my physical therapist and he saw bags and trash on the ground, basically asking me to fall and end up in back in the hospital, he was less excited than I was. But this was a big moment for me. And it encouraged me to then begin starting adding in some strength training. I had never been the biggest fan of the weight room, which I know my father-in-law, Mr. Egerman, is probably not gonna be super excited to hear. Um, but, you know, again, I was always that scrawny guy and I felt like if I was in the weight room, other people would be outlifting me and I had a little pride, so I wanted to avoid that. But after this experience, I began to really fall in love with this process. And ultimately, getting stronger allowed me to jog again, which progressed to running, jumping, and eventually getting clear to compete again, which absolutely terrified everyone, myself included, and after 18 months of rehab, which was hard to say the least, I made a return to the track while being honored by the Duke University Athletic Department with the Comeback Athlete of the Year Award. And they graciously made this video as a tribute. Um, knowing that he came back from such a traumatic injury um, means that a lot of us uh, make a lot less excuses for some of the things that we do. Um, and so like, you know, when you're like feeling tired in a workout or uh, whatever the case may be, you just think about JR and his injury and all he had to do to get back. And, sacrifices he had to make for his injury. Um, his injury was really severe and it was pretty traumatic the way it happened. Um, a lot of the kids saw it happen and knew how serious it was. He uh, completely destroyed his, his knee, tore most of the ligaments in it. Um, and the doctors weren't sure if he was ever gonna be able to compete again. Just seeing him back out there at practice and his energy and his uh, spirit, he's a really uh, fun going guy, laughs a lot. You know, people, everyone on the team really feeds off of his energy. So um, it's been great having him back out there and he's you know come back stronger and faster in a lot of ways than he was before and pushing a lot of the guys on the team. So it's been really good to have him back. I think uh, what makes JR so special is um, his character is really, really strong and he takes everything he does seriously. He has a strong faith and he really, really like takes that in, uh, in everything he does and tries to spread his personality and upbeat personality to everyone else. Jero's a great kid. He has a very high character. Um, I've been able to talk to him a lot outside of practice and get to know him a lot through his injury because you know, I wasn't able to submit practice as much. So we were able to connect a little more there. And, and he's a great kid. Um, everybody on the team really respects him and his character um, is definitely top notch. So. Now, although I would go on to find a lot of fulfillment in my collegiate career, serving as team captain my senior year and having a ton of fun with these amazing people that you saw in this video. I still knew the Olympics were not in the cards, so I had to figure out something to do with myself after college. And given the impact that my orthopedic surgeon had on me and helping me get back to doing what I loved, I thought maybe doing what he did would be pretty cool. 
And so I was told that first I would have to go to medical school, which meant first I had to do uh, some of these pre-med requirements that I had no idea what they were at the time. So they signed me up for Organic Chemistry 1, and I got a C. I'm pretty sure I was actually grateful for this grade at the time. And the next term, I took Organic Chemistry 2, another pre-med requirement, and down came another C. And at this point, I questioned whether or not I could really be a pre-med student, let alone go to medical school, and definitely let alone become a surgeon. These classes were hard. And even though I told myself I loved doing hard things, for some reason, hard academic things felt different than hard athletic things. And now I've come to realize that it's because I saw results in sports faster than I did in the classroom. Every week there was a new track meet that I could use to track my results in my sport, and sports just felt more normal, more natural for me. But in school, weeks went by between exams, and I felt like I was always behind, especially when I compared myself to other pre-med students at Duke. And if I had to pick between the two evils of training for my sport and studying, I would pick training every time. But at this point, I was already in love with doing the hard thing. And struggling in these pre-med classes gave me the incredible opportunity to see if going against the grain and, ch and chasing after the hard things in another arena of life would translate the same. So I started approaching my studies in the same way. After practice, the last thing I ever wanted to do was study, but that meant that was probably the first thing that I should do. So instead of going home to that couch, I would walk directly to the library. And instead of letting myself procrastinate on assignments that I would push to tomorrow, although I realized tomorrow usually did not come, those tasks became due today. And eventually I started experiencing the rewards. My grades improved, I developed stronger study habits and skills, and ultimately I was able to build a strong enough application to be accepted into Mayo's medical school, something I never thought was possible. And just like all seasons of life, my experience as a medical student would introduce new challenges that I would face. But now I felt programmed to see hard as, opportun uh, as opportunities. I experienced enough of the rewards of choosing to go against the grain that transferred across different aspects of my life. I learned that hard is the entrance to growth. When something felt hard, if I leaned into it, I grew and I improved. When my 5 a.m. alarm went off telling me to start studying, no part of that was enjoyable, but it signaled to me that growth was on the other side. And as I learned these skills to succeed as a student, I wanted to share them. So I created a YouTube channel with YouTube videos, which was extremely hard. And if you look at some of these first videos, which I highly advise not doing, you would think that I had a better chance of going to the NBA than anyone actually watching any of these videos. But challenges were now fuel for my motivation. And now, not only do a few people watch, but over 35,000 are, su are subscribed, and we even have a mentorship community for pre-medical and medical students called Teach As You Learn that my wife helps me manage. During medical school, our family grew to now include my perfect son, Kari. And Madison will be the first to tell you that balancing family, medical school, and all these side projects are definitely not easy. But again, now we know that easy keeps you stagnant and hard leads to growth. Now, even though I'm technically a physician, I tried to keep anatomy and science talk to a minimum, but I couldn't help myself. Don't worry, I'll keep this part very short. But scientists have actually found an area in the brain called the anterior mid cingulate cortex that appears to be related to our willpower and our discipline. Now, ignore how complicated this name sounds. I don't know why scientists name things like this, but they recognize that when people actively do things that they don't want to do, this area of the brain grows. And when people succumb to consistently choosing the easy choice, this area, or this area atrophies or shrinks. This is why at the end of summer, when you've been able to just to basically do all the things that you want to do, that first week going back to school is pretty tough. The key they found is doing what you don't want to do. So if you're a maniac and actually enjoy running, then going for a run probably won't help this, er this area of your brain grow. But if you don't like running, joining your crazy friends on a stroll will actually strengthen this region of the brain. And what's particularly amazing about this is the stronger this region becomes, the easier it is to do hard things. It's the part of the brain that controls our discipline. And now we know how to actually train it. It's no different than a muscle. It's by pushing ourselves to do hard things. Does anyone know who this is? He knows, yep. This is, this is David Goggins. He's a Marine, an ultra marathon runner, author, and honestly, a bit of a crazy person. But he has essentially committed his life towards doing hard things and things that he doesn't want to do. And I'm sure that he probably has one of the largest anterior mid cingulate cortexes in human history. It's what allows him to run over 100 mile races consistently and break records like the pull-up record where he did over 4,000 pull-ups in 24 hours. The discipline he has developed has not only allowed him to excel on race day and when he's chasing these world, world records, but it's what allows him to prepare day in and day out with a level of intensity that leads to all of his game day success. So I will leave you with this. What decisions do you make when you're faced with something hard? 
What do you think about when you're given a tough assignment in school or your teachers push you in the gym or the weight room? I don't expect you to fall in love with this feeling yet or automatically feel the need to challenge yourself not to choose the easier path. When I was in high school, I definitely wasn't there yet. But in high school, it, that, that is when I started recognizing the value of hard things. And that recognition eventually turned into a complete dedication to challenge, a love for the hard thing. So as you go throughout the day, be aware of your response to hard. Will you suck your teeth, roll your eyes, and run in the opposite and safer direction? Or will, you, or will you make a decision to embrace the hard thing, developing your discipline muscle in the process and training yourself to be able to do greater and harder things in the future? Thank you so much for your time. So I hope that you guys enjoyed this speech and learning a little bit about my story. If you're new here, it was probably the best introduction to this channel, but if you did enjoy this video, be sure to like and subscribe if you haven't already. And as always, keep evolving and I'll see you guys in the next one.